Okay, normally it's being recorded. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for um, coming to this uh, second Nobel Prize in Economics lecture, which I hope will become a tradition here. Uh, so we are very happy uh, to have a dream team uh, today that we present uh, the, 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 the Nobel of uh, this year. So we have uh, Xavier Dotfeuille uh, from uh, Crest and Sae, Francis Rana. Uh, Roland Radlow from Crest and Say, and uh, Pauline Rossi from X Crest. And uh, so this year Nobel is uh, about uh, the contributions of David Card, Joshua Angrist, and Guido Imbens. Though David Card for his, uh, was sharing half of the prize for his empirical contributions to labor economics. So he's um, uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. Joshua Angris from MIT and Guido Imbens from Stanford are uh, sharing the other half for their methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. And so today, the plan of the lecture uh, will be that we'll have Pauline Rossi, who will start uh, with Angris and Imbens, Imbens' contributions to applied economics. So we'll give a broad introduction of causality and their contributions and methodology about causality. Then Xavier will push uh, further with contributions uh, of also Angrist and events. And then Francis Kramer will uh, talk about David Card, mostly about his works on minimum wage and wage structure. And Roland Ratlow will finish with David Card contributions to labor, mostly about immigration and education. If I remember. Uh, so one uh, piece of uh, advice, I really strongly uh, encourage you to stay until the end. We might have a surprise, very prestigious guests around 1.50 p.m. Uh, because of the US time zone, it's not 100% sure, but we really hope that this person will be able to make it. So stay until the end, we have a nice surprise for you. And so right now we leave the floor to Pauline Rossi. And so, Pauline, you can share the slides and start. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right, so I will start with uh, Angris and Imben's contributions to applied economics. And uh, this contribution can be uh, summarized by an expression that was uh, coined by Angris himself, which is the credibility revolution. And so this revolution was to put uh, causal questions at the core of applied economics and to propose methods to answer these questions using observational data. So observational is by opposition uh, to experimental data where the researcher sets up his own experiment to answer the question. So here the idea instead is to use what we call natural experiments. So experiments that are caused by nature, institutions or policy changes. And we will give a lot of examples uh, during this lecture. Another important keyword is design-based approach that merges the standard econometrics framework with the potential outcomes framework for causal inference. And uh, Xavier will uh, tell you more about this uh, methodological contribution. Uh, but to apply the economist, really the, the main contribution is to provide uh, methods based on assumptions that are very clearly stated and uh, very easy to challenge. And that's where the credibility comes from, is that everyone understands what's going on and everyone can decide whether uh, they think that the assumptions are plausible or not in a given context. So I will, uh, as an illustration, I will use the returns to education because historically it's one of the first applications of these new uh, methods. So I will first illustrate the key idea that uh, correlation is not causation and explain why quantifying a causal link is difficult. And then I will introduce their main innovation, which is instrumental variables. And I will uh, present at the end uh, two designs where instruments are mostly used uh, today, which are regression discontinuity designs and encouragement designs. <clears throat> So suppose that you're interested in estimating the causal effect of years of schooling on wages. And uh, you have a data set with uh, years of schooling on the X axis and yearly income on the Y axis. And each dot is an individual. So if you run a, a linear regression, you will fit a line like this through the data. And the question is whether the slope of this line 
is a good uh, estimate of the causal effect of years of schooling on yearly income. Uh, and the answer is no, and to see uh, why, let's uh, suppose that you have two types of individuals in your data set, uh, high ability individuals that I mark with a cross, and they are overrepresented in the high schooling, high income part of the graph, and low ability individuals that I show with a circle, and they are overrepresented in the low schooling, low income type of the part of the graph. So if you run a, a linear regression in these two uh, samples separately, you will uh, plot a line like this that is much flatter than the one that you obtain with the whole sample. So here you see that with the whole sample, the black line, the slope overestimates the strength of the uh, effect of schooling on income because you don't take into account the fact that you have two types of individuals in your data set. So that's an example of what we call a omitted variable bias, is that when we look at the correlation between schooling and wage, we capture both the causal effect of schooling and wage, but also the correlation between ability, schooling, and wage. So ability is just uh, one example of uh, what we call omitted variable. So there are other um, reasons why uh, highly educated individuals will also earn more money we can think of motivation, parental support, health issues, et cetera. Uh, and the main issue is that we don't observe these uh, confounding variables. Maybe they are very difficult to measure. So what, what can we do? And the solution that was proposed uh, by Angris and Imbens is uh, instrumental variables. So the idea is to find an instrument that is related to years of schooling. That's what we call relevance but that's unrelated to all the other determinants of wages that are also correlated with schooling. So that's what we call exogeneity. So we need to find a dimension that determines the schooling of people, but is unrelated to all the other determinants of wages. And so Angris and Kruger were the first in 1991 to propose a quarter of birth as an instrument for years of schooling. And so their idea is to use a compulsory uh, schooling laws as a natural experiment. So as you know, in many countries, children have to stay in school until a given age. So let's say age 16. Um, and then they can enter school also at a given age. So for instance, in France or in the US, uh, children who are born later in the year start school at a younger age. And therefore they have to stay in school longer. So if you remember when you enter primary school, those who are born in the first quarter of the year, so January, February, March, they will enroll in grade one when they are 6.5 years uh, old on average. So they turn six, but they have to wait until September to enter primary school. So when they turn 16, they are in the middle of grade 10, and that's when they are allowed to drop out. But those who are born later in the year, in the fourth quarter, um, so October, November, December, they enroll in primary school when they are 5.5 years old. It's only during the school year that they turn six. So when they turn 16 and they are allowed to drop out, they are already in the middle of grade 11. So that's why those who are born earlier in the year uh, have to uh, stay in school less long as those who are born later in the year. So that's the relevance part. When you are born in the year, determines how long you have to stay in school. For the exhaustion 80 part, Children born later in the year should be similar to those born earlier. So a priori, we have no reason to think that those who are born in January are systematically different than those who are born in December. So let me show you uh, visually that uh, the instrument is relevant so that there is a correlation between quarter of birth and years of schooling. So on the Y axis, I show you the birth cohort of the children and the quarter of birth. And on the y-axis, uh, it's the years of education. So you see a general uh, upward trend in education. Cohorts are more and more educated over time. But within a given birth cohort, you see that those who are born later in the year are systematically more educated than those who are born younger in the year. And if we estimate uh, the, the cor correlation, it's around 0.10. What about the effect on earnings now? So on the y-axis, it's no longer education, it's earnings. And you can see the same pattern. Those who are born later in the year 
tend to earn more money than those who are born earlier uh, in the year. And here the uh, uh, correlation is around 0.01. So that's the intuition behind uh, the instrument is that if you want to look at the causal effect of X on Y, you have to proceed in two steps. First, you estimate uh, the effect of Z on X. That's what we call the first stage. And then you estimate the effect of Z on Y. That's what we call the reduced form. And by dividing the two coefficients, you can get the effect of X on Y. So if I uh, take the returns to schooling example, I just showed you that when we increase the quarter of birth by one, we increase schooling by 0.1 year and we increase income by 1%. So this implies that if you increase schooling by one year, you would increase income by 10%. So if you ask um, many economists today, what are the returns to schooling? They will probably uh, answer uh, something around 10%. That's the order of magnitude that we have in mind. And this is based on this paper and other papers that have exploited similar uh, types of natural experiments. So the core assumptions are very clearly stated. The first one is the instrument should be relevant. So there should be a correlation with the endogenous variable. And that's what I've showed you, that there is a correlation between quarter of birth and schooling. And the second one is exogeneity. So there should be, this comes in two parts. First, the instrument should not be correlated to other factors. That's the independence assumption. And second, the instrument should have no direct effect on the outcome. That's the exclusion restriction. So this assumption is a bit more difficult to test because there is an infinite list of uh, omitted variables that we would like to check whether or not they are related to the instrument. Uh, but you can uh, try to provide some support by looking at important omitted variables and check uh, whether the instrument is, is exogenous or not. So in, the, uh, in this example, uh, almost 20 years later, after the publication of the original article, uh, some researchers have argued that uh, the, exogeny the exogeneity assumption in fact does not hold uh, because quarter of birth is correlated with maternal education. So on this graph, I plot again the birth cohort, but here on the y-axis, it's not the education of the child, it's the education of the mother. And you can see that those who are born in the winter tend to have mothers that are less educated than those who are born in the summer. And this is because educated women tend to plan their births to have their kids, if they can, around spring or summer so that they can uh, extend the maternity leave with the summer break and it makes things easier uh, to balance uh, work duties and family duties. So this is an issue for us because now we don't know whether the correlation that we observe between quarter of birth and wage goes through the years of schooling or through the maternal education. So that's an example where the exogeneity assumption would fail through violation of independence. Um, another example of violation is that a quarter of birth is correlated with test scores. And here I show you the example with physical education, mathematics, and science. And you can see that for different school years, seven, eight, or nine, the children who are born, uh, who are older, tend to have better grades than the children who are younger. And this is something that is well known to teachers, is that at a young age, being one year older makes a big difference in terms of cognitive abilities and, and physical abilities. And therefore the children in the class who are older tend to perform better than the children who are younger. So that's an issue because the instrument now no longer determines how long you stay in school, but also how well you do in school. And how well you do in school determines how long you stay, what type of major you choose, what type of university you attend, so in the end, what type of job you have and your wage. So this is an example where exogeneity fails through violation of the exclusion restriction. So quarter of birth is a very famous example of an instrument. I will uh, mention, I will give two other uh, examples. Uh, one was proposed by Angrist and Evans uh, to look at the impact of the number of children on, on female labor supply. So is it because you have kids that you stop working or is it that women who don't want to work tend to have more kids on average? So to uh, uh, know in which way the causality goes, uh, they propose to instrument the number of children by the gender composition of the firstborn children. 
So they show that in a sample of couples, those who have two boys or two girls tend to be more likely to have a third child compared to couples who have one boy and one girl. So since the uh, gender of a child is random, these couples are all the same on average. So then you can compare um, the couples who have two boys, two girls with the couples who have one boy, one girl, and look at the labor supply of the mother to estimate the effect of having a third child. Another famous example uh, by Angris and Lavi is to estimate the effect of class size on test scores. So we all believe that having uh, smaller groups, children learn better when they are in smaller groups, but we don't know the size of the effect. Is it a big effect or a small effect? Um, and here the idea is to instrument class size uh, with using a rule, Maimonides rule, that would uh, set a maximum number of children per class. So if this number is 20, for example, and in a given school, you have 40 students coming in a new cohort, then they will do two classrooms. But if there are 41 students, then they will have to do three classrooms. Uh, and whether uh, in a given school, in a given cohort, you have 40 or 41 students, it's just a matter of luck. So then you can compare the schools with two big classes and the schools with three smaller classes to look at the effect on uh, the test scores of the children. So that's uh, kind of the fun part with instruments is that uh, you have to be creative, you have to uh, get out of uh, the office, you know, to see how people make decisions, how things work uh, in life, uh, to find ideas about instruments, so you can get ideas just by watching TV or talking with your friends. Uh, but the difficulty is that uh, it's almost impossible to find uh, a proper instrument. So even these two that seem very clever, when you really think about it, um, they will be correlated with other stuff. So the, just like the quarter of birth instrument, you can find um, violations to the exogeneity assumption. So I think that today, um, researchers mostly used instrument in two uh, specific cases. Um, the first one is regression discontinuity designs, where the idea is to take advantage of an institutional feature that uh, generates a discontinuity in the exposure to a treatment. So for instance, you, your income has to be below a given cutoff to be able to benefit from a program. And, and then the idea is that the units just above and just below the cutoff are similar. So it's just a matter of luck, whether your income is just below the cutoff and you can benefit from the program or not. So then you will use the cutoff as an instrument for participation in the treatment. If I go back to the returns to education example, a uh, widely uh, used instrument is admission cutoffs at elite schools. So in Polytechnic, for instance, the last admitted student is very similar to the first non-admitted student, just that one was a little bit more lucky uh, on the day of the exam. So you can track these two students later in life and see if one does better than the other. And that will give you uh, the effect of attending uh, Polytechnic. So Angrist and co-authors have used this design to estimate the effect of elite schools in the US. Uh, and so based on the title of the paper, the elite illusion, you can guess that they don't find a uh, large effect. And last, uh, the uh, instruments are uh, widely used uh, in combination with experiments in what we call encouragement designs. Uh, and so that's to solve one of the problems that uh, many people face when they uh, do an experiment is that they uh, initially allocate their subjects to treatment and control group, but then people don't always comply with the assignment. So some people in the treatment group will not receive the treatment for some reasons, and some people in the control group will manage to get the treatment also for some reasons. And so then the actual treatment status X is not the same as the initial randomized assignment and X is endogenous. And so the solution here is simply to use uh, the initial assignment as an instrument for the actual status. So this is a case where uh, you have really an ideal instrument in the sense that the uh, randomized assignment is correlated with the actual treatment if at least some people comply and this is almost always the case. And uh, that is exogenous because it was constructed randomly. So in the returns to education example, this will be for instance, admission lotteries. So in the US you have a specific schools called charter schools 
uh, where when they are oversubscribed, they just run a lottery to know who will be able to enroll in the school. Um, so you can use that uh, as an experiment. Now there is imperfect compliance in the sense that you can uh, apply to many schools uh, and you can be admitted to many schools, win the lottery in many schools, but then you have to decide where you go. So in the end, the result of the lottery is not exactly the same people that those who will enroll in the school. So using these admission lotteries, Angrist and his co-authors have uh, estimated that uh, charter schools in the US are quite effective at uh, improving students' learning. Okay, so just to uh, wrap up, for uh, applied economists, the main contribution was to strengthen the credibility of applied work by making it uh, really clear what is the thought experiment, who are we comparing with whom, and by making the plausibility of the assumptions very easy to assess and to challenge. But it also raised uh, many new questions for econometricians, like why do different instruments lead to different coefficients? What if only some units respond to the instrument? What if the treatment effect is heterogeneous? And uh, Angris, together with Imbens, have uh, proposed a general econometric framework to answer these questions. And that's what uh, Xavier will uh, talk about uh, now. Thank you very much, Pauline. Um, so this is the turn to Xavier. So I propose that we do the first part on econometrics, then we will see there are a bit of questions. I think we are on time, and then we, we can move to the second part and maybe more. So Xavier, the floor is yours. You are muted, so. Yes. OK, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, attending. Uh, um, oops. OK, this should be fine now. Uh, so indeed, uh, let me now uh, dig into uh, the main uh, methodological contribution of uh, Angrist and the uh, Inbens and uh, the reason uh, why I believe they received their Nobel Prize. Uh, so let me start by uh, the genesis of uh, the paper I will mostly focus on uh, in this talk, uh, which is uh, this paper that uh, Pauline already mentioned, uh, that is to say, uh, identification and estimation of local average treatment effect, a paper that was published in uh, Econometrica in 1994. And the main idea behind is uh, pretty trivial. Uh, it's just that people are heterogeneous. Uh, we are uh, considering uh, uh, human beings uh, and contrary to, I don't know, uh, particles in physics, uh, uh, people are heterogeneous. So uh, two different people uh, will react uh, differently to the same situation. Uh, this is pretty trivial uh, and obvious, but we have to recognize that uh, for a long time, uh, until I would say the beginning of the 90s, uh, this point was not really uh, well accounted uh, in econometrics. And uh, in particular, there was a more or less implicit assumption that effects uh, or reactions were homogeneous across people. And probably there is uh, some good history to be done about that, but uh, my uh, personal view would be that this was coming from the fact that initially uh, econometrics was done for uh, macroeconomic reasons, and usually there is uh, in macroeconomics, uh, at least as, uh, until recently, this view of a representative agent where all people would, could be summarized by a single in agent uh, with a homogeneous reaction by construction. Uh, so what do we mean by heterogeneity? Here we mean uh, two things. The fact that people may react differently to treatment. So if we think about a recent example, uh, two people may have different reaction to uh, vaccination. And if we think about uh, more economic examples, uh, it would be the case that two firms uh, could react differently to uh, taxes they, they face. They could, uh, uh, two, two different people may have also uh, different returns to education, etc. And there is another aspect which is important as well uh, and uh, was, I think, also not fully recognized until the work of Imbens and Angris, which is that people may also react differently to an instrumental variable. 
Uh, so there are many examples, but uh, let me discuss uh, throughout this talk uh, the example of uh, the paper by Angrist and Evans that uh, uh, Pauline already uh, mentioned. So in their paper, they uh, consider, the, they try to identify the effect of fertility on uh, the labor uh, supply of, uh, of uh, females. And to this end, they use the sex composition of the first two children. So their instrument in their case is equal to one if the first two children are of different sex and is equal to zero otherwise. And uh, here, what I mean by heterogeneity uh, to the instrument is the fact that some parents don't care about the, the sex composition of their children in the sense that they have decided to have two uh, children, no matter what is the situation, or they have decided to have three children. But some may react to uh, the instrument, uh, meaning that they are happy to have two children if they are of different sex. But uh, if they have two boys or two girls, they would, they would like to have a third child because they would like to have a, a child of a different sex. Okay. So that's what I mean by heterogeneous reaction to the instrument. And the question behind the paper of uh, Imbens and Angrist is, uh, how does this heterogeneity affect the interpretation of usual estimators? So of the, in particular, the usual uh, two-stage least square estimator. So uh, to be clear, this two-stage least square estimator that uh, Pauline already mentioned was already known uh, by, uh, uh, by the time of Imbens and Angris. Uh, it was invented uh, actually during the uh, 20s. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this, is, uh, this was old thing. Uh, but the, the, the question was really how should we interpret uh, this estimator uh, in this context where we can have it to reach it. So let me consider the, 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 a bit more formally uh, the setup uh, and the question of uh, imbens and Angrist. Uh, so there will be a little bit more of uh, equations than uh, in Pauline's talk, I, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, so, so let me uh, just uh, consider the, not the notation. So we will consider the, the, the simplest possible framework where the, the treatment, uh, the so-called treatment, is binary, meaning that there are only two possible situations. Uh, so if I consider vaccination, this would be either I am uh, vaccinated or not. Uh, uh, if I consider the case of uh, the, the paper of Angrist and Evans, uh, this will be having uh, uh, three children or, or more versus having only two. Uh, so here I don't consider the exact number of children uh, for, for simplicity. And uh, the instrument will be binary as well. And uh, in uh, the example of Angrist and uh, Evans, again, uh, this would correspond to having two children of uh, different sex, uh, of the same sex, uh, sorry, versus uh, having uh, two children of different sex. Uh, in the example of uh, experiments with imperfect compliance that Pauline also mentioned, uh, this would correspond to have, uh, being uh, uh, allocated to the treatment group, uh, if that is equal to zero, uh, to one, versus uh, to the control group with uh, z equal to zero. And then we have the so-called outcome variable, uh, which is the variable of, uh, of the final variable of interest. So wages is the example of returns to schooling. In Angrist and Evans, uh, it could be uh, several things. Uh, the simplest uh, would be uh, I, uh, I work or not. The, the, uh, the mother works or, or she doesn't. It could be also the number of hours she works. And then uh, the two-stage least square estimator in this very simple setup uh, just corresponds to uh, the ratio. So to be precise, uh, it will uh, converge uh, as the sample size uh, grows larger. It will converge to this quantity, uh, which is just this ratio. Uh, and I denoted by beta z, uh, the reason why I index it with z uh, will be uh, clearer later. And the question behind Imbens and Angrist is uh, how can we relate this beta z to causal effect of the treatment d on y? And in order to, to, to begin to answer this question, we first need uh, to define a bit uh, more precisely what we mean by causality. Uh, and for this, uh, we need to introduce potential variables. This is something uh, that is uh, somewhat trivial, uh, technically speaking, but uh, uh, philosophically, it was really a, a key insight. Uh, and uh, I believe the, the, the first person to, uh, ha to, to have developed uh, this uh, 
no notation of uh, potential variables was uh, Jardine Neyman, uh, who is uh, also a famous, very famous uh, statistician uh, known uh, for uh, his uh, foundational work on uh, hypothesis testing. And he actually uh, introduced his potential variables in his master dissertation. I, uh, I discovered that uh, recently. And uh, uh, so this was also a bit uh, forgotten for a long time. And then it was kind of rediscovered by Donald Rubin, who is also a, a very famous uh, statistician. So the idea behind is the following. So we, we are going to introduce uh, variables, uh, random variables corresponding to counterfactual world. Uh, so for treatments, uh, uh, we introduce two potential variables that are called D0 and D1. And D of zero is a treatment if the instrument is equal to zero. And then D of one is a treatment if the instrument is equal to one. So this corresponds to two variables that may or may not be observed. Uh, what we will observe the, will correspond to the, the, the treatment of the individual, assigned to the individual. So that is to say, we instead of observing at the same time D of zero and D of one, we only observe D of big Z, uh, which is the, the, the instrument that the individual receives. So for instance, in Hungary and events, uh, it may be the case that uh, the family has two children of the same sex, in which case, uh, uh, the instrument is equal to one, and we only observe D of one, uh, which is uh, the number of children of this family given that uh, the two first children are of the same sex. Now, if they, this family has two different uh, uh, children, two first children of uh, uh, different sex, Z is equal to zero, and we only observe D of zero. But for this given family, we never in, uh, observe at the same time D of zero or D of, and D of one. We only observe uh, one, uh, one of these two. And now we can do the same with, uh, with outcomes. So now we have actually two uh, potential outcomes, Y of zero and Y of one. Y of zero corresponds to the outcome absent the treatment. And Y of one is uh, uh, the outcome with the treatment. Uh, so again, uh, we only observe uh, one of these two random variables, which is Y of big D, the realized treatment. So in Angry and events, uh, if the family decides to have uh, three children, we only have D equal to one, and thus uh, we only observe Y of one. Okay. And now in this context, we can define uh, what we mean by a causal effect. What we mean by a causal effect is just a different Y of one minus Y of zero. Uh, so it's a difference between two counterfactual situations, uh, one where the treatment is equal to one and one where the treatment is equal to zero. And so for a given individual or for a given family, uh, we are interested by, by the effect uh, if uh, the everything else remaining constant, uh, the number of children moves from uh, uh, two to three or more. And here, what is important, what we mean by heterogeneous treatment effect is the fact that Y1 minus Y0 uh, can vary from one family to another. The effect is not the same for everyone. Okay, so Imbens and Angrist uh, in this context may make two uh, most important uh, assumptions. So the first assumption is the independence of the instrument. This assumption states that the instrument is independent of all the potential variables that I just introduced. Uh, so here this sign means independent in this probabilistic uh, sense. Independence will be credible typically in randomized experiments uh, because in this context, Z is allocated randomly independently of the, of the people, of the, the characteristics of these people, and so independently of all these variables. It's also uh, pretty credible in natural experiments uh, such as uh, that of uh, uh, on, on risk and events because in this uh, context, uh, we can uh, see Z as a draw by the nature. Uh, the, the nature draws the sex of the first two children, which makes this assumption uh, pretty credible. The second condition is monotonicity. And uh, it's uh, perhaps less intuitive. 
here we will assume that d of one is always greater than d of zero. So almost surely, this means for everybody. Uh, what does it uh, mean or is it uh, credible? Well, in randomized experiments, uh, even if uh, it's uh, an imperfect, uh, we have imperfect compliance, it's still credible uh, if people in the control group cannot be treated. Uh, because in this case, d of zero is equal to zero, and then uh, this will be always satisfied. Now, uh, it may not be uh, always satisfied in uh, uh, randomized experiments with encouragement design, because in this case, for instance, if people uh, receive some money uh, for being treated, uh, then it may be the case that uh, people will, uh, this will create a crowding out effect. Uh, people don't want to get money for, uh, for doing something. At least some people don't. And if this is the case, uh, then uh, they, it could be that the, they uh, would prefer to be uh, treated if they don't receive any money. But if they begin to receive money, then they prefer not to be treated. Okay. Uh, in Angristan events, uh, this uh, could also fail to work if we imagine that some parents, for instance, uh, would absolutely want uh, to have uh, two boys, for instance. In this case, uh, if they have one boy and one girl, then they would want to have a third child to have two boys. Uh, while if they have two boys in the first place, uh, they would prefer not to have a third child. Okay. So this assumption may not hold in all contexts. Now, if we have this assumption together with an independence, if we have uh, this also inequality, which is basically the fact that the first stage uh, is, uh, is not uh, equal to zero. Huh? So uh, in uh, Pauline's uh, example uh, pre previously, the correlation in the first stage should not be equal to zero. Then uh, what Ingbens and Angris show is that uh, beta z uh, is equal to an average treatment effect. So the, this is the treatment effect. We take its expectation, but we consider it for a subpopulation. This subpopulation of people for which, for whom D1 is strictly greater than D0. So it, this is the reason why they call uh, this, they have in this, their title, this uh, uh, local average treatment effect uh, term. Because here, what they show is that beta z will identify an effect which is local. Okay. It does not apply to the full uh, population, but only to the people who are such that d1 is greater than d0. These people are called the compliers because they react to the instrument. They comply to the instrument. Okay. An important insight, uh, and I think this was really uh, major, is that uh, if we change the instrument, we change D1 and D0. And as a result, we change the population of compliers, which means that we don't get, we, we have no reason to get the same parameter uh, beta Z, which is the reason why I index my beta by Z, because if I change uh, Z, I would change the corresponding parameter. And before that, people always had this belief that, well, if I have two instruments that are valid, then there is no reason why uh, the coefficients that I get at the end should be different. Here, this theorem shows that it may not hold. If we have heterogeneity in treatment effects, uh, which means that this term here is not constant, uh, and if uh, the instrument uh, is not perfect, then uh, the beta will depend on that. Uh, Julien, how much time do I have? Uh, I mean, you can continue. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm not sure we, you will want to say this in uh, <laughs> some constraints. Yeah, let's say 10, 10 minutes okay. more. And... Okay, okay, very good. So um, now we, we have to think a, a little bit uh, uh, about these two assumptions uh, because we see that uh, monotonicity and uh, Independence, independence were the, the two assumptions on, under which we obtained this result. So if independence fails, we do not identify a causal effect in general. And this is not really surprising. It's related to the fact that, uh, roughly speaking, we, we need the, the instrument to be, uh, to be exogenous. Uh, now, what we have to recognize is that this assumption may be a bit 
more uh, subtle than it looks like. So in the example of uh, Hungary and events, uh, we can argue, as I did before, that the sex composition is completely exogenous. It's drawn by nature. And this is true. Still, the issue is that sex composition could have a direct effect on uh, the decision of uh, mothers to work or not. Why is it so? Well, this is not something that I invented, but uh, that is argued by uh, Rosenzweig and uh, Wolpin uh, in a paper where they somewhat criticize uh, natural experiments. And uh, the point is to say that, for instance, so it's a bit far-fetched, huh, but um, the, if you have two boys, then uh, you can use uh, the same clauses uh, for the second boy uh, as for the first boy. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, you will spend less money on, uh, the, on the clauses of the second boy uh, than uh, if it's a girl. Uh, and that, that's just an example showing that, well, the consumption may differ if uh, uh, the first two children are of the same sex. And if this is the case, uh, well, it, it will affect the budget set of households. And as a result, uh, if you look at the standard economic model, uh, also the decision to work or not uh, for the mother. So here we could argue that this is a second order effect, but still it could be a bit present. Um, now, what happens if monotonicity fails, uh, the second assumption? Here, uh, in this case, it's more, it's, it's uh, easier to, to, to uh, define what we get at the end. So if in this case, uh, we have to define a, a new family of, uh, of population, which is called the defiers that I denote by F here. Uh, so the family, uh, the, the, the subpopulation for which D of one is smaller, is smaller than D zero. And in this case, beta Z can be written as a composition, uh, a weighted average between the effect of the compliers and the effect of the defiers. And what is important here is that you have this lambda uh, parameter, which is the ratio between the, the size of the compliers and the difference between the size of the compliers and the size of the defiers. And lambda is greater than one, which means that actually beta Z is a difference uh, because this second term is a, 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 appears with a, a minus sign here. One minus lambda is negative. And so uh, the, the uh, implication is uh, important because it could be the case that everyone has a positive treatment effect and Y1 minus Y0 is positive for everyone, but still because of this uh, one minus lambda that is negative here, beta Z could be negative. So you could be very far away from the true effects uh, in, uh, in such a setup. Yet there is, a, I think uh, I uh, find a, a nice paper by, uh, uh, Clément de Chaise Martin, who shows that uh, in this case, beta, beta Z can still identify a causal effect if we replace monotonicity by a much weaker condition, which he calls a compliance defiance condition. So, actually, the result of Angrist and Imben somewhat survive uh, to the failure of monotonicity. Now, uh, there has been many extensions uh, also just to illustrate the fact that this paper uh, has uh, been uh, very influential in the microeconometric uh, literature. Uh, there were many extensions to this initial paper. So this initial paper has considered a very simple setup uh, where the uh, treatment is binary, the instrument is binary, and there were no covariates. So here, I'm not going to discuss uh, uh, all the extensions, but some of them. So there were first some extension uh, still by Angrist and Iman showing uh, that uh, we don't need to assume that the treatment is, uh, is binary. Uh, so they also extended to a non-binary, but still ordered treatment. Uh, the, the treatment is still ordered. So it could be, for instance, uh, education, the number of children, level of taxes, et cetera. And in this case, so here I just write the formula for the case of a continuous uh, treatment. Uh, beta Z can be written in a similar way, uh, where here we have the derivative of Y. So YD is still the potential outcome uh, corresponding to the level uh, small d. And here, this would be the marginal effect, uh, the derivative of Y with respect to D. And I take this, the expectation of this uh, 
marginal effect. And here I have also some weights that I did not uh, I did not describe here because they are somewhat complicated. But this is random weights uh, which are positive and uh, uh, with expectation equal to one. So the, this result may be seen as similar to uh, the result uh, for a binary treatment. There were also some extension uh, to unordered treatment. Um, so here, uh, contrary to these uh, to these two papers, and you can see that uh, these results for unordered treatment are really recent. So there are still some active research uh, re related to uh, Angry and Imet's work. Uh, there has been also some extension to non-binary instruments. So intuitively, if the instrument uh, takes more than two values, we can learn more things actually than just the late, the local average treatment effect. Uh, so there was a partic in particular this work by Ekman and Picasil showing uh, that if uh, we have a condition on the potential treatment, which is related to monotonicity, uh, so this condition may be uh, written as uh, here. So D of Z is equal to uh, the indicator of P of Z greater than U. And U is in the U Y zero Y one is independent of Z. Then we have a result which is of the same flavor as Angrist and Inbens, showing that basically we can recover a very local average treatment effect. So the average treatment effect for people with a U that is equal to some value p0. And we, we can recover this value by looking at a sort of uh, beta z, uh, but which is generalized in this, uh, in this framework with a continuous instrument. Uh, and this is, was called by uh, Ekman and Vitlasil the, uh, the, the local instrumental variable estimator. Here we see again the the, the, the influence of Angrist and events. Still two uh, other setup where this was uh, influential are uh, regression discontinuity designs and difference in differences. So uh, Francis and uh, Roland will talk more about difference in differences. Uh, and uh, we have actually a paper uh, with Clément de Ches Martin showing the link uh, with some types of difference in differences uh, uh, with uh, instrumental variables, but let me focus here on uh, regression discontinuity designs. Uh, so here, what Pauline has told you about uh, the situation where people may become to be treated if they go above a given threshold. Now there are actually uh, plenty of situations where things are a bit uh, more blurred in the sense that uh, you can be treated below the threshold. You can uh, also be untreated above the threshold. But at the threshold, there is still a discontinuity. Uh, so there is a higher proportion of people that will uh, get the treatment. So an example would be grade retention with a GPA below uh, 10 over 20. So with this idea that uh, there can be some people who repeat their grade if uh, their grade, uh, if their average is above 10. There are still some people who will not repeat their grade if their average is below 10, but still uh, at this threshold, there can be a, a jump in the probability to, to repeat your grade. And basically what was shown by Han, Todd, and Van der Kloh in 2001, is that uh, in this setup, there is also a link between uh, the work of Imbens and Angrist and uh, the, uh, the way we can exploit this discontinuity. Uh, if I, I look at the, the, uh, basically how the outcome evolves just around the threshold, and I divide this by how the treatment evolves just below the threshold, I will get an, an, a local effect for the people who react to the fact that they are above or below the threshold. So still a population of compliance. OK, so let me uh, conclude. And uh, just to say that uh, there was a, a really a profound influence of uh, this paper of embeds and Angrist on the methodological study of causal effects. And uh, here, I just focused on this paper, but uh, 
Uh, if we look at uh, uh, all the publications of uh, Guido Imbens, and uh, here I'm mentioning Guido Imbens because Josh Angrist is more on the applied side, uh, but some of uh, his work has actually been done also with Josh Angrist. Uh, th there are many other papers uh, looking at uh, issues related to Kozolik. So here I just mentioned a few, a few themes. Uh, so Imbens has an important work on matching estimators, on uh, regression discontinuity designs, on difference in differences uh, as well, uh, also on uh, quantile, uh, uh, quantile regressions and quantile regressions with instrumental variables. And recently, I think uh, also importantly, he has done some work with Susan Assi in particular on uh, how we can incorporate uh, and use machine learning tools uh, to understand better causality. So I think I'm already over time, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Xavier. Uh, I think we, we can take one or two questions just to take a small break. So if some people have a question, just please unmute yourself and, uh, and Pauline and Xavier will, will, will answer. Um, so feel free to... Uh... I have a small uh, practical question. Sure, uh, how, how can you identify the population of compliers and uh, defiers, for example, in uh, Angus and Evans? So we cannot, this is a good question. Uh, we cannot identify whether a given individual or a given household is a, a, a complier. Uh, what we can do on the other hand is identify the size of uh, compliers, the size of always takers and the size of never takers. Uh, basically, the, the size of uh, compliers will just be identified uh, by the difference. Uh, so the expectation of D given Z equal one minus expectation of D given Z equal to zero. Okay. And we can identify with similar formulas, uh, the size of always takers and the size of never takers. All right, thanks. Maybe other questions, feel free to unmute or comments uh, about uh, the history of macro and their impact on <laughs> that Beatrice is around. I think there are good anecdotes also on the invention of instrumental variables because uh, there was some uh, debate whether it was uh, the, the father or his son that really invented uh, the instrumental variable. So I don't remember the, the name of these guys, but uh, there was a the right. written the right. by the, the right. father, but uh, with an appendix written by the son, if I uh, remember well, and it was com not completely clear who invented at the end the instrumental variables. Okay, all right. So if there is no more question, maybe we can move to the second part now, which would be about uh, David Card and Labor Economics. Uh, so Francis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see? Yes. So, Tommy, can you hear me as uh, the older among you might know? Okay, so this is about David Card and his contributions. He, uh, David receives half of the prize if I can move, yes. Okay, so if you think about it, at least that's the way I see it, David Card is the quintessential labor economist. I don't think that there are many labor papers that at some stage in their uh, bibliography don't cite David Card. Uh, it, it's really impressive how he has been everywhere. You'll see this uh, with Roland's presentation. I will focus on Two, uh, two parts, I'm presenting uh, what he does in two parts. One is about uh, quasi-experiments captured by shocks on labor demand. And this is mostly the minimum wage quasi-experiment, the Card and Kruger uh, papers uh, that in fact are uh, cited first in the, in, in the tribute of the Nobel Committee. And then something that is not presently, uh, presented this way, in uh, the tribute, it's the statistical structure of the equilibrium price, supposedly equating demand and supply, labor demand and labor supply, the wages, and how they are shaped, what shapes them, market, firms, workers, unions. 
And uh, I'll be more precise, I guess, slightly later. Okay. Uh, it's the minimum wage paper in the US, the Carbon Kruger paper, uh, was published in the AER in 1994. It's one of the two most famous and talked about quasi natural experiments in labor. I guess that the other one will be presented by, uh, by Holland later. It still has, and of course it had an enormous influence in policy, uh, other scholars in the field and well beyond the field, both in the US and in the rest of the world. Um, and that led to a debate that was almost religious, as I'll try to briefly state. Okay, so the title of the paper, if I can get rid of what's shown above, uh, is uh, Minimum Wages and Employment, a Case Study of the Fast Food Industry in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. The title says it all. Let me read the abstract. One thing that I'm trying to teach here is that the papers that are written in these drawers are always super well written. That is everything is, you can be found everything both in the introduction and in the abstract. So on April uh, 1st, 1992, New Jersey's minimum wage rose from 425 to 505 per hour. To evaluate the impact of the law, we surveyed 410 fast food restaurants in New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania before and after the rise. So it tells you exactly what they do they have fast food restaurants in New Jersey where the minimum wage takes, uh, increase takes place, Eastern Pennsylvania, which is close to New Jersey physically, before and after the rise. So that means we, uh, that was mentioned before, it's gonna be about difference in difference. Comparisons of employment growth at stores in New Jersey and Pennsylvania where the minimum wage was constant, provide simple estimates of the effect of a higher minimum wage. We also compare employment changes at stores in New Jersey that were initially paying high wages above $5 to the changes at lower wage stores. We find no indication that the rise in the minimum wage reduced employment. So no effect of the minimum wage. So let me, so because the paper uh, really is super simple on the statistical side, but super important data collection efforts, super important design, uh, interest in the design of the experiment, we should be clear about what's going on. So the users, the hike in the minimum wage that took place April 1st, 1992 in the state of New Jersey. It's important to think that the hike was decided at the beginning of year 1990 by the state assembly. As you know, there's no national minimum wage, there's a federal minimum wage, uh, which was I think 425 at that time, but every state can decide to increase the minimum wage after a vote. And at the moment, for instance, the minimum wage in, 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 in California is much higher than in many other uh, states. So it was decided well in advance. The hike was criticized by the local MEDEF. And interestingly, the hike was decided before the recession in 1992 took place in the state. That is, had they known and decided knowing the existence of a recession, they would not have uh, instigated this hike in the minimum wage. I mean, the state assembly would have voted against. So it was contraint et forcé that they decided that they had to go and, and apply it. So you would expect that that should maximize the effect of a hike in the minimum wage because every uh, employer would be unhappy in particular at the moment or in the aftermath of a recession. Uh, in the neighboring state, Pennsylvania, the minimum wage stayed and changed at the federal minimum wage. Starting 1992, Calvin Kruger decided to study the industry. It's 25% of the restaurants industry, in particular because they tend to apply legislation as you will see. And because they usually respond to telephone survey, except McDonald's, who was excluded from the survey. So uh, important, uh, and that was also a matter of debate, the data will be collected by a, uh, the Princeton University Center for uh, uh, Data Collection. Uh, I'm not sure it's exactly how it was named, but that really was a local effort by Princeton University to collect data because they were, at that time, access to administrative data was super hard. And a lot of 
the debate will be about the data. So it's important to, to see that it was the first time they ever did a, such a survey. And that was a local survey. We'll see with the debate with the new market in Russia. The survey comprises uh, 410 fast food restaurants in New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania, which is close to New Jersey. Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Wendy, and Roy Rogers. Two ways before the high from mid February to beginning March, and after the high from November to December 1992. First result, and I'm uh, showing you the number. So it's the wage, the distribu distribution of starting wage rates in these, uh, in these stores. Okay, and they show the percent of stores with the different wages. So as you see, a large fraction is a, a strictly applying the minimum wage legislation at 425, but some were uh, in Pennsylvania were paying higher wage, already the new one. Okay, and the 505, at least the one that will take place in New Jersey. But there is a distribution, okay? As you see, after the increase, every, uh, every uh, store in New Jersey applied the minimum wage legislation and very few went above that. So there was some sort of convergence uh, to the new minimum wage, whereas in Pennsylvania, there was a, a, bit, a bit of decrease in the fraction paying uh, 425, but even though it's not very strong, it's just because the, the, the hike at 405 in the graph in New Jersey just compresses the whole distribution. But you see in, 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 in Pennsylvania, it's 30% here. It was above a little above 30%. So there's, it was relatively unaffected uh, in Pennsylvania. The, district, the wage. So the legislation was applied. Excellent. Now what they do is they look at stores. Full FT means full-time employment. Another thing that you need to see and that I, I, I insist on teaching, all the these tables are self-contained. That is all the num all the notes describe exactly what's going on. So First column, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, second column, the difference, full-time employment before. Uh, the, in Pennsylvania, the, 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 the jobs number of um, full-time employment larger than in New Jersey. Uh, full-time employment after, uh, unchanged in New Jersey, decreased in, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania. The change, in fact, so that's the difference, minus two almost zero in New Jersey. And the difference in difference is above 2.7 and statistically significant because these things are, uh, this is our standard errors as it's in parent disease. So this is the first surprise. Something is going on, not necessarily uh, in New Jersey, but in, in Pennsylvania, okay? Uh, first, uh, the, the difference was negative. There are more jobs in Pennsylvania than in New Jersey. And for some reason, they decreased the number of jobs in between, okay, in Pennsylvania, okay, which was not affected by the increase in the minimum wage. But still, because of the difference in different uh, methodology, you see a, a positive impact. That is, rather than destroying jobs, if you believe in those numbers, then there was a creation of jobs in New Jersey with respect to Pennsylvania after the, 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 the minimum wage increase. Okay, and then you, they do lots of controls, lots of things. Nothing helps. Nothing helps uh, in, in decreasing the coefficient. That is, the increasing minimum wage increases employment. Okay. That'll, be a, that'll have an impact in the aftermath of the paper. That was published in the AER. That had a huge impact. Let me show you. Uh, it, it generated a huge amount of discussions, of debates. On one side, you had the Chicago school who was religious about, about minimum wages. You should not have minimum wages. Uh, any increase in wage decreases employment. And you had the people from Harvard, Princeton, 
that were somehow more left-wing or more Democrat-oriented, that were just uh, more agnostic, I would say, about the results, but all aligned behind the Cardin crew. Okay, so in the aftermath, uh, Newmark and Washer uh, decided to re-examine the uh, CK evidence, the Cardin Kruger evidence. In fact, they asked uh, Burger King and Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises, franchises to access their administrative payroll data, the local DADS, the ADS, uh, as well as from Wendy's, Rogers, Rogers franchises, and company-owned restaurants, in 80% of the zip codes from Cardin Kruger. Interestingly, the data were partly collected by Newmark and Washer, partly collected by the Employment Policies Institute. The Employment Policies Institute was uh, affiliated to the local MEDEF, I would say, or the MEDEF. That is, it was uh, held by uh, uh, and some sort of employer association, and the employment measures were based on total number of hours were converted, converted into full-time employment. And, very much the line was you would, you would expect from new market washer knowing their uh, view on minimum wages, they were negative employment. Again, published in the AR, lots of discussions and lots of debates all surrounding not the methods, but essentially the data. So now in a good example of how you abuse your uh, official position, I shouldn't say that because uh, Allah, uh, now it's a little more open. It's the the way it's done in French to the in French to the says the is more reasonable. Uh, Kruger became chief economist of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and he used the data that could be accessed there, and no one else could access, uh, to get the data uh, on every quarter on the unemployment insurance data that gives you uh, the number of covered workers selected among eating and drinking industry with the right names, that is the chains, added seven more counties from the seven original ones in Pennsylvania. It's longitudinal. They re resolve the various problems, uh, that the, the statistical problems, but these are administrative data, very similar to the data. And what they show is that there is no effect of the minimum wage hike in uh, uh, New Jersey versus Pennsylvania. And that is the difference in difference gives you zero, nothing significant. And this became the consensus in the US. Uh, this became the consensus and then generated lots of discussions uh, uh, and in particular, in the United States, the results were seen as evidence of monopsony power of employers with the ID, and that was in particular supported by the book, uh, the Alan Manning's book called Monopsony in Motion. Uh, and that's when there's monopsony power, that is the work, the employers have too much power and set the wage, uh, enough power of other wage and labor supply. Uh, minimum wages can be good for employment. And the line of research on monopsony has been and is really flourishing at the moment, focusing on, 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 on the power of employers. And indeed, the Nobel Committee has adopted this view, forgetting clear cut evidence, for instance, for France, uh, that, and, and evidence for France are uh, even accepted by some left wing economists, let's call them Piketty. Uh, that believe that because in France there's uh, payroll taxes that were added up to the 90s uh, to the minimum wage. The minimum wage includes, is comprised of uh, employee paid payroll taxes, but employer paid payroll taxes almost double the cost of the minimum wage. They decreased starting in 1994 and are close to zero now. This makes the minimum wage still high in terms of minimum wage, but with no detrimental effect on unemployment. However, in all countries, the minimum wage appears to be good on inequality. 
But these questions are indeed very political. We've, we've seen that in the US, the debate in the US is pretty uh, important. There was also these questions in Germany where they, there was no minimum wage for many years. Uh, Ulrike Merkel set up a, a, a minimum wage there. There was the debate of, uh, about the minimum wage for the young in French, which again was super political, whereas in the UK, when they instated the minimum wage, which didn't exist before the 90s, they clearly had different minimum wages for the people for, uh, at 16, at 18 and above. Uh, and all this is okay. It's a political question and it's very specific to every country. And that's, there's no science that doesn't depend on, on the country about these things. Okay, now let me talk about something completely different, if I can say so. I would like to talk about David Kart's style. That's not something that is presented in, in the, they present most of these papers. In fact, all these papers in, in the tribute to David Kart. but let me talk about the style because I think this is something which is specific to David Kart and a bunch of others, in particular John A. Down, and which I think uh, is super interesting for us uh, at Crest in a place where we value data, we value statistics, and we value theory. Uh, so let me go through four papers uh, rapidly uh, and briefly summarize what they do. Uh, in the first one, it's it's joined with Abound. It's uh, they look at uh, uh, how earnings and hours change in conjunction. So We'll see that. Then another paper looks at what is the effect of unions on wages using relatively novel data in those years, which is uh, uh, data in which you know the evolving status of uh, workers vis-a-vis -vis their unions. And then two papers that use much employee data to study German, uh, West German inequality and to look at how uh, the, the the gender wage gap, and what's the impact of firms uh, on this. Okay, so this is a paper, so I, I uh, for those who don't want to listen to me, the, the abstract is, is, uh, is again very well uh, written. They use uh, typically longitudinal data, uh, various uh, surveys. Again, in those years, didn't have access to administrative data sources. Uh, and they look at how earnings and hours change in conjunction. Uh, they, they look at that because their idea would be when there's a shock, then normally wages and hours should change and theory tells us how they should change, okay? So first they uh, show that across data sets, uh, a simple components of various models uh, with three components describe the data. So that the statistical part, serially incorrelated measurement error, a shared component of earnings and hours with the second order moving average covariance structure and a non-stationary component that affects only the variance and contemporaneous covariance of hours and, and earnings. In the second part, they show how the model, simple life cycle labor supply model, uh, uh, should predict what happens in the data. And in fact, what they show is that most of the covariation of earnings and occur, uh, hours occurs at fixed hourly wage rates, meaning that wages don't move as frequently or as much as theory predicts. Most of the adjustment is on hours, not on the wage. Okay, so that goes in contrast with the, uh, the, inter the theory that generates some intertemporal substitution elasticity between earnings and hours. Okay, so that's really archetypical. It's a su it was super important when I started to do research, that paper, super highly cited. And I think this is interesting to see. A second paper that I mentioned is the one on, on wages and units. Typically, in France, this is a, a, a country where we don't care about unions in some sense because everybody's unionized in the sense that everybody's covered. 
by a bargaining agreement, which is far from truth in the US. In the US, you can only strike when there's, uh, when there's a renegotiation of a bargaining agreement and to have a bargaining agreement, workers in a given plant uh, or in a given firm must vote. There are very nice papers that look at that. So not every worker is, is, is unionized and those that are unionized, everyone in the firm is unionized after a vote, okay? But workers can vote against unions, okay? And the idea here for him will be to look in, in, in a longitudinal way, what happens when, they're, when workers become unionized, okay? And what selection bias takes place? Who are the workers who are unionized versus that, uh, those that are not unionized? And what they show is that the selection bias differ by skill group. That is, typically, unionized workers are positively selected for lower levels of observed skills. That is, those who vote for unions and then are unionized are workers with relatively low levels of observed skills. Whereas union workers are negatively selected from among those with higher level of observed skills, higher education, for instance. So something like <coughs> technicians or engineers, when they're unionized, are not of high, uh, uh, of high quality as measured by the wage. And here the wage, the wage, David Card uses is some sort of log wage, which is additive in, in observed skills. An observed skill, which is generates a selection bias plus a union wage effect, which he estimates using uh, uh, sophisticated for the time at least econometric techniques, which explains why it was published in economics. Then two papers in which uh, again, uh, David Card in, uh, with uh, uh, Jörg Eining and, 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 and Pat Klein look at the increase in wage inequality in the aftermath of the Hartz reforms. There, he starts from a model in which the wage can be decomposed into the sum of a person effect and a firm effect. So again, that's the statistical structure that, you know, the way he approaches these problems. And then he endowed with that uh, statistical structure, it gets data that allows him and his co-authors to look at the issue at stake, that is data that in which you can follow workers over time, and you can identify the establishment at which each worker is employed at every point in time. That allows you to decompose uh, uh, the wage into uh, worker and, and firm effects. He decomposes the various periods uh, before the Hartz reforms, which took place around 2003 and after the Hartz reforms. And what he's able to show <coughs> is the uh, following. Our estimates suggest that the increasing dispersion of West German wages as a reason from a combination of rising heterogeneity workers, rising dispersions in the wage premiums at different establishments, and increasing assertiveness in the assignment of workers to place, to plants. Which means that, in fact, and the most important part is that, in fact, new establishments entered uh, entered the, the market, paying potentially low wages. And over time, workers, high wage workers, went more and more often to firms that pay high wages, so high wage firms. And by uh, contrast, low wage workers were more and more uh, working in low wage firms. One example of this is <coughs> a paper by Goldschmidt and Schmieders that shows that. Uh, firms that were paying high wages started to subcontract some of their, of their cleaning personnel, some of their, of their um, uh, food, people were serving their canteen personnel to, uh, because they were, they were initially paying them high wages, but then by moving them away, by subcontracting the work, 
these workers were moved to plants that were paying much lower wages. Okay, so that took place because uh, institute changes uh, with the health reforms were super important and allowed uh, temp agencies and some contracting to expand in a country in which that was almost impossible before 2000. The fourth paper I want to mention again uses this uh, decomposition uh, between firm effects and, and worker effects to look at in Portugal with uh, David, with uh, Ana Ruta Cardoso and, and um, again, Pat Klein, uh, trying to decompose the gender wage gap. So they have excellent data. And, and the idea here is to say, okay, let's assume that the firm effect can be either, you, you can have like a firm effect for the women and a firm effect for the men. Then assume that maybe these firm effects for men and women can be different. Okay, potentially because uh, unions will defend uh, occupation in which uh, men are more present than women. That would be true, for instance, of the CGT in France, which has always been soup for many years, not now, I think, who's always been defending the skilled workers, skilled blue collar workers who mostly were men in France, and when women were mostly. Uh, uh, low skilled blue collar workers. Now, of course, if there's a, this, some sort of discrimination in the bargaining, in the bargaining uh, that takes place, then that's one explanation. But there's also another explanation that is the firms at which men work may be different from the firm at which women work. That is, there is sorting, women don't work in the same firms as men. And then the other explanation is bargaining. And then, of course, if men go to firms that pay higher wages than women, that go to firms that pay slightly lower wages, then maybe the sorting will have an impact on, on, on uh, the gender wage gap, will explain part of the gender wage gap. And indeed, that what they show is essentially uh, uh, the, the, the bargaining explanation that is bargaining is different for men and women is only minimal in the gender wage gap. Most of the gender wage gap, at least when you look at this on top of other explanations, comes from the fact that the sorting of men into jobs and women into jobs is very different. Men go to firms that pay high wages whereas women go to firms that pay low wage. Okay, and that, that has been clearly shown and was really an important uh, contribution to, to the, this question of the gender wage. Okay, this was my last slide, and I think I should give the floor to Roland. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Um, so now, uh... I'm perfectly on time. So, great. So, uh, Roland, the floor is yours now. And uh, we will finish by some questions at the end and maybe your surprise guests, we hope. Thank you. Let me try to share. Okay. So, uh, thanks a lot, Julien, for organizing all uh, this, uh, this session. Um, yeah, so I'm going to carry on uh, talking about David Card's contributions. Uh, actually, I would start by saying that if you're interested by, by David Card and his contributions, I would urge you to uh, listen to the beautiful uh, masterclass he gave a few days ago at the uh, American Economic Association conference. It's, uh, it's really, really, really good. Uh, it's, it's actually going, uh, starting from where Francis uh, was talking about and elaborating on wage setting. It's a, uh, and monopsony and all these these issues. It's a, it's a very very good presentation, uh, and I'm sure uh, I will I will put the link so that you can you can go to it. But don't go right now. I will just talk to you through a, a little bit of, of his work uh, on uh, mostly uh, immigration, segregation, and ethnic gaps, and also uh, education. 
so let's start uh, by basically one paper that was extremely influential uh, of David Cards. I mean, among the many papers that were very influential of his, uh, this one is about immigration and the impact of immigration on uh, local labor markets. Um, so there is a little, of course, I mean, in all countries, there is a lot of debate about what are the consequences of immigration on labor markets. And in particular, uh, the, the problem is that, that we faced, I mean, economists and basically policymakers faced before this paper and this literature is that it was mostly correlational. Uh, that is, you could measure where immigrants were settling in, you could measure what was going on, where, where they were settling in or where they were not settling in. But at the end of the day, of course, they are not settling in uh, randomly on the territory. So the Marriott boat lift is going to be one of uh, what Pauline and, 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 and Xavier were talking about, about this kind of method of card, which is to try to take into account, uh, to take a natural experiment. You cannot really randomize where people are going. So you, you can basically try to take out of what existed in history, something that looks like a natural experiment. So the Maribel lift, uh, that's the paper and this impact on the Miami labor market. And that's published in the uh, ILR review in 1990. So as I said, before the mile boat lift, I mean, what happened is that it was still, a hot, it was already a hot topic. Uh, in the eighties, you have a lot of papers that rely on, on cross city variation. So basically you just compare cities that attract immigrants to cities that don't attract immigrants. You measure how the labor market is going, and then uh, you basically try to conclude about something of the effect of migrants. So the, the thing is that the literature, of course, at that point, the, the economists were also well aware of their own limitations, and they were kind of wondering what was the what kind of bias they could be getting. And in particular, I mean, the, the main bias that they were aware of were that a possible positive bias due to migrants that would settle in places that were relatively attractive from the labor market point of view. So if, uh, if migrants are only targeting places with booming labor markets, you should have some kind of a positive bias on when you try to just assess the effect of migrants on local labor market. So what is the mild boat lift uh, as a natural experiment? Well, before being a natural experiment, uh, and a blessing for economists, it was also a human tragedy. Uh, so uh, in, in that case, uh, it's the arrival of, of uh, 120,000 Cubans that entered the, the US territory, mostly in 1980 and, and, and 1981, uh, and mostly in the region around Miami. Uh, the Marials uh, were these migrants, they were called the Marials. Uh, they are relatively less skilled, uh, younger, more male, and with lower English ability than the Cubans that uh, were uh, that had migrated before to Miami. So these are particularly a population that was deemed to be difficult to integrate on the labor market, less skilled and and in in all dimensions less skilled. Are there uh, were there a lot of them? Well, it's, it was a lot of people, and it, it induced a 7% increase in the labor force of Miami and a you 20% know, increase in the number of Cuban workers in, in uh, Cuban workers in, in Miami. So it's a, it's a very sizable shock. And, and also it's interesting because uh, what David Card is doing very well in his paper is that he also says that it was expected to be a very negative shock. So in a sense, they were not skilled at all. One of the most important reaction was actually at that point, uh, quite a lot of crime. So crime went up, uh, which, which triggered also a, a lot of political backlash uh, against the Marials. So it was not an easy story and, and nothing happening. It was really a very, uh, very important event for the city of Miami. Um, so what is, what is Card doing? Uh, 10 years after uh, the events, he basically takes the CPS data, so this is the current population survey, which is, I mean, of course, nowadays we're used to papers that are using increasingly expensive and, and large uh, data sets. But at that point, I mean, what, what Card mentions is that it's already a very fine data set. So in a sense, it's individual level. It is, and, and not like just aggregate level, like some studies could have done. It's a relatively large sample, 
it has also detailed ethnicity, which is uh, useful in this particular case, because then you can basically look at the Cuban uh, uh, labor market or the labor market of uh, Afro African Americans. Um, and basically it's an event study. So Carl looks at the evolution between 1979 and 1985 of unemployment rates uh, and the log wages in Miami and comparing the evolution in, in, in the selection of other cities. Uh, so it takes Atlanta, uh, Houston, Los Angeles, and Tampa, in, which is also in Florida. Um, and so selecting this, uh, this control group as some kind of cities that were far enough that they were not impacted by the Marios directly, maybe with the exception of Tampa, uh, but uh, big enough and close enough in terms of characteristics so that they can be compared to, uh, to Miami. Um, so, so if you want, it's, it's also sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's so sometimes the beginning of synthetic control in a way, because you're kind of taking uh, places that somehow add a similar trends beforehand, even if you do it in a very non-technical and very intuitive way here. Um, so the results is that, uh, Card cannot reject that the mild bull lift had no effect on the Miami labor markets, uh, wages, and unemployment. And so it does that in a way also to isolate and trying to consider different populations. So trying to kind of see whether it's something about uh, just the Blacks, the Cubans, and so on. But, but then the, the just, you know, it's, there is just nothing clear about the effect on wages and unemployment. So it's interesting because the, the Marils was such a dramatic event in the, in the history of Miami and crime and everything and political backlash. But then at the end of the day, it's really as if, as if nothing happened on the, on the labor market. So the contributions of the, this paper are, are that it's really one, the first one that really brings clean identification assumptions to, to this literature and, and arguably exogenous uh, identification here. Um, it's that of course it's not perfect. I mean, it was the 1990s, and here the problem lies mostly with the data. So in a sense, it's not usually precise. So the question is how how small an impact we can reject with this kind of data. Um, and then there is the the, the famous uh, external validity question, which is Miami in the 80s was a place where that was used to integrate waves of, of migrants, in particular Cuban migrants. And then the question is really where, whether other places in the world for which we're interested about the, the, the impact of immigration would be as um, flexible and as dynamic as Miami in the, in the 80s was. So the interesting thing is that there is a direct of spring to this study. Uh, one of the really, I mean, almost contemporaneous one is, is the one by Jennifer Hunt uh, that actually looks at the French labor market. And, and it's also published in the same journal in, in 1992. And it looks at the 1962 repatriates from Algeria. And so it's not, if you want, it's a difference. It's a, of course a different story. It's also a big shock, it's an enormous shock as well. Uh, but not as big as the as the miles for the local labor market they are considered. And the problem, of course, with this case is that it's not as local. So it's not like these boats that really converge to one labor market. The, the repatriates spread much more in, in France. And so identification is much more difficult. The results are actually slightly different. So in a sense, uh, Jenny Hunt rules out a large effect on unemployment, but she actually finds um, something on wages. So some, some decrease, some wage moderation on, uh, uh, on, on, the, on, on French wages, actually. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting paper, slightly different results, but also a different strategy, but totally like the same spirit as the Maya lift. You have other papers that I'm not going to detail, but you're of course uh, very welcome to look at. And I'm just mentioning the one by Friedberg in, the, in, the, in Israel or, or Glitz in, in, in Germany. Um, but then there are many others. So um, just also to mention the, 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 the furthest offspring really. So if you look at, at these papers, I mean, I think that this is the one I considered as really a direct, uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, 
granddaughter uh, of 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 cars mild bolt lift uh, but it's uh, it's also probably the best paper on the topic at the moment so in a sense the most credible and and doing a lot of things so it's the one by Dustman Schenberg and, and Stula published in the in the quarterly journal of economics uh, in in 2017 so directly inspired by by cult strategy but really leveraging the power uh, of of german uh, modern administrative data so they are uh, uh, studying uh, this event that I try to hear us pronouncing, which is the Grenz Gänge Regelung, uh, which is basically something that happened uh, 14 months after the fall of the Iron Curtain uh, at the border between Germany and Czech Republic, or what is today Czech Republic. Um, and basically that allowed Czech workers to enter the German territory and to work in Germany, but not to reside in Germany. So they had to go back home uh, to, 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 to leave. So basically by construction, it's a very local shock because it's, you, you cannot just work everywhere. And, and, of, and some, uh, uh, there were like some eligible uh, German uh, border municipalities where, where they could work in. And so it's actually a very big shock. So because it's so concentrated on such a, a, few, uh, a few municipalities at the border, it's really around 10% of employment in these border municipalities. So big shock, very localized and well identified. So looking at doing exactly the same thing as, as CARD has done up to some adjustment because the you know, identification science has progressed a little bit. Basically what they find is that one percentage point increase in the share of check lead to, uh, and, and here they are very precise. So that's the good thing with this uh, administrative data. It leads to, uh, to a decrease of 0.1 uh, of wages, a decrease of 0.9 of native uh, employment, uh, but still increase overall in, uh, in local employment because of the people who kind of came in. So there is, there looks like there is some kind of substitution going on, at least locally in these municipalities. Um, the, interestingly, the effects are much larger for the unskilled than for the skilled workers. And also there is a difference between the young and the less young. So the younger natives, they seem to be affected more on the wages uh, than on the employment. And so it could be a difference in terms of how elastic in terms of labor supply they are and how mobile they are as well. Um, what is interesting in this study, uh, sorry, what is interesting in this study is that it's not exactly the same conceptual exercise as the one we usually have for, for immigration. Remember that here, people do not live in that municipality, which means that in particular, they did not consume in these municipalities. So there is, of course, when you have people coming in and also consuming in some place, uh, they are actually also contributing to the local economy through their demand for services uh, or local services, which here it's actually shut down. So it's a particular exercise. So it's a very good paper in terms of identification, but it examines the effect of a very particular policy, which is not typically should not be taken as, you know, the effect that immigration has. It should actually be taken as some kind of the worst that Im immigration can produce because you don't allow people to consume locally. So just still on, on this topic of immigration and uh, another paper of card much more recent um, actually asked a very interesting question. It says, okay, we, there is a consensus that immigration, you know, it has small effects at the end of the day on wages and employment, but it's still, you know, consistently, usually unpopular. Um, and so why is that? And so they try to ask the question of whether it's really something that, you know, as economists, maybe we're taking that in the wrong way. Maybe we, you know, we're just trying to say, okay, look, immigration doesn't have any effect or very little effect on, 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 on employment and wages. So you shouldn't be worried about immigrants, but that's maybe, we, you know, that's absolutely not what people are concerned about. Uh, and so, so what they are looking at right now, uh, well, in this paper is that actually natives are just, you know, the value being surrounded by other natives. So they, they, there are some like compositional amenities to have people around you that look like you. And so if that is the case, then, you know, you can try to convince people that, you know, there is no effect on the labor market. It's just not, not never going to matter in any kind of way. So what I try to use for that is that they use the European social survey uh, that has questions about you know the labor market and social impacts on migration but also 
the desirability of, of increasing or reducing immigrant inflows. And so they try to measure the, the relative importance of economic and compositional concerns in driving opinions about immigration policy. And what they find is that, well, the, the compositional concerns, which are just about you know, being surrounded by people like you or not like you, are two to five times more important in explaining the variation in individual attitudes toward immigration policy than concerns about wages or taxes. And most of the difference that you have between the more and the less educated people is actually attributable to heightened compositional concerns about among people with lower education. So in short, this Compositional, uh, 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 compositional concerns actually do matter. And it's not enough to just convince people that the impact of immigration are just little. One final paper on, on this uh, overall topic of immigration and segregation, because that the, the previous paper was actually touching the topic of segregation, is this paper by Card, Mass, and Rothstein that actually also looks a little bit as something that, that, ha that has the same flavor. Um, so we have huge evidence in sociology about the evidence about white, white flight. So what is called white flight, which is that um, you know, just the, the majority population uh, ethnically would just uh, uh, um, go away from places that where there is a large share of uh, people that are not of the same ethnic group. Um, and Schilling was a famous uh, sociologist, hypothesized the existence of some tipping points. So maybe some kind of non-linearity, if you want, in the relationship between the share of migrants and how uh, white people tolerate it uh, in a way, and when they would leave. Um, and so Cobb, Mass, and Rothstein, Rothstein they, they test for the existence of this kind of discontinuities uh, in the dynamic of, of the neighborhood racial composition. Uh, using census, census data. Um, and the result is that indeed there seems to be some kind of tipping like behavior in most cities with, you know, when, when, when the population of, um, when the minority reaches five to 20%, uh, it looks like a, a, a whites start to actually flee uh, the, the, the place. Um, Interestingly, there are not so much linearities in rents or housing prices in these tipping points. And you have this kind of correlation between how large the tipping point is and how tolerant in surveys uh, people declare they are, which is, I guess, good, a good thing for these surveys. Um, another topic that I would be shorter about is not because it's not important, but just you know, because you have to make choices in the, in the you know, in all the corpus of what Carl produced is something about uh, education. So I think on education, Carl actually started this kind of, not started the debate because the debate was already there, but uh, really improved on something that is actually even very uh, a topic of, of research nowadays, which is the, the, all, the, uh, all the, the reasons for which uh, some schools are better than others. And or some education systems are better than others. So not the question of the quantity of education, but more the question of the quality of education. Um, and this paper published in the Journal of Political Economy in, 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 in 92, they really try to go back to this question of, you know, can we relate indicators of quality to, uh, to, to the, the, the returns to education? So the context of this paper is that there is a huge literature in the 60s and 80s that does uh, describe the, the, the expenditure of the school inputs and student achievements. Uh, usually, it's, it's usually correlation. Um, so the contribution of this paper is really, well, first to actually go beyond student achievement because it looks at uh, labor market outcomes rather than academic, academic achievements. And it also looks at, uh, at a, trying to kind of get an identification strategy that, that goes beyond correlation. So that's the only equation or, yeah, I think that's the only equation that, that, that we'll have here, but it's, it's really important to, to have a grasp of what they are doing here. So you consider the earnings of people, uh, individual I that is born in state J, lives in state K, and belongs to cohort C, okay? So these individuals are, you take their earnings when they're adults and they live in some place, not necessarily where they're born. And then you look at, you're looking at 
well, how educated they are. Um, and you allow the returns to education to depend on two things. Well, three, okay, cohort, fine, but also the state where they come from and now where they live, okay? So you're going to say, okay, this part is actually having to do with the quality of the school system that you probably went into. And this one has to do with the local labor market that can be more or less rewarding towards education, okay? And so the problem that, of course, if you don't do that, you have is that you're going to confound what is due to the local labor market returns from what is due to the, the, the quality of the schooling system. And probably these two things are correlated. So you want to kind of try to tear, tear apart what is due to the, 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 the schooling system where you grew up into and the, the local labor market where you work into. And so then you control by a bunch of fixed effects that depend on where you, your cohort and your, your state of birth, your cohort and your state of residence, characteristics, error term, here you go, okay? So the, the big thing here is that you want to tear apart these two things. Of course, you can only tear apart these two things for with the, with the movers, okay? So you have to use people that actually do not, if everyone was actually uh, living in the place where they were born, then you would be, uh, you, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to actually uh, identify these two, uh, these two things. So here you rely on movers to identify this, and that's the key of the identification strategy that they have here. So now they have this uh, famous gamma, which represent the returns to education for court C for people who were born in state J, okay? So now they can actually estimate uh, by regressing this gamma on the quality measures, they can estimate what they're interested in, which is how uh, uh, the quality measures, which could be, for instance, the, the pupil teacher ratio or how our long terms are, or what are the wages of the teachers, they can, they can look at how this is linked to uh, the, the returns to education. So the result is that the, the, the returns to education are higher for individuals that attended schools uh, with less pupils per teacher and better paid teacher. Term length doesn't seem to, to, to be uh, of, of much importance. So it's, it's actually trying to kind of one step towards better identification in this question. They have a paper pretty much the same year. So one was in the JPE, this one is in the Quality Journal of Economics, uh, doing a little bit the same on different question, which is there's been a convergence uh, between blacks and whites earnings uh, between six, the 60s and the 80s. And the question was whether school quality uh, and the fact that school quality in particular improved in the US South uh, was important to explain what was going on here. So they use actually exactly the same kind of strategy uh, in order to get a result that at the end of the day, uh, probably the fact that the schools got better in the South contributed to uh, roughly 20% of the convergence between the earnings uh, of the earnings between uh, blacks and whites in the US during this period. One paper once more about the, the really uh, what you can do best in terms of uh, nowadays on, on this kind of, of question that you once more it's really direct uh, uh, offspring of, uh, of of card is this paper by uh, Kirabo Jackson and, and and Johnson Persico. They take exactly the same question with modern data, uh, and they have an even better identification strategy. And so, which you know, I won't elaborate on, but uh, but you you can you can have a look at the paper if you're interested in. Uh, but basically, they also find something very similar to what uh, Card and Kruger got, a 10% increase in, in the per pupil spending each year. Uh, it, it, it triggers uh, uh, something like 0.3 more completed years of education and 7% higher wages, which is quite substantial. Um, and, and so there, there is this direct of spring, and then there is also more, many more papers about, for instance, the importance of teachers the importance of peer effects. And I mean, the, the literature on, on education quality nowadays is really still flourishing. Uh, so so it's, it's really every year you will see uh, papers about that nowadays. So last slide, um, as I agree with Francis uh, claim that it's difficult to conceive nowadays a labor economy that has not been influenced one way or another and probably both by David Card's work. Um, and 
many subfields has been influential too. And, and the fact is that David Card keeps on going. So, so is uh, just, just because that's, there is this paper that I like that is just published in the AER if you want to look into it about ethnic gaps in, in Brazil uh, with uh, uh, Gia uh, Lagos and Severini. Um, so yeah, so uh, thanks a lot. And uh, no, I mean, thanks uh, David Card for what he's done. Uh, and uh, I will post uh, the, 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 the 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 link to the to the lecture that you really have to to have a look at thanks thanks a lot uh, Roland and thanks all the speakers for this great presentation uh, I know it's dense but uh, we have known uh, of course than this and uh, I think it was a uh, very clear and uh, insightful for everyone uh, uh, presentation of all the works so um, yeah, we still have uh, maybe a bit of time for questions and uh, our guest is coming. So we, we are waiting a few minutes to time for uh, him to connect. And, uh, oh, no, he's here. Uh, so we are very, very pleased to welcome. Uh, so maybe Roland, you can share your slides and uh, we can all see each other. Um, yeah, so we are very pleased to have uh, Josh Andres with us uh, for the, Conclusion of this Nobel lecture. So, Bonjour, Julian. <laughs> Bonjour, Josh. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, yeah, perfectly. Yeah, Francis, hey. Oli, Xavier, uh, Roland. Hi. Thanks a lot for being here. Yes. So, uh, we, are, we just finished the lecture uh, with uh, everybody is uh, fully uh, uh, briefed on uh, all your contributions <laughs> and okay. everything. So, you are free to, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, I, bet, I bet you are. Well, I don't have much to say, except that I appreciate that you guys uh, did this. And uh, I haven't seen what you've said, but I'm sure it's uh, better than I could put it myself. And if it's recorded, I'll watch the, I'll watch the tape later. And uh, is this a special occasion of some kind or just uh, you're just uh, summarizing the Nobel we, it's a kind of a new tradition that we try to do every year too. So we, we did it last year for Paul and, and uh, Robert Wilson. And so now we are doing it uh, for you this year. So it's, uh, uh -huh. we're trying to do it every year now. Yeah. I see, wonderful. Uh, it's well, also an occasion, you know, Josh, since the crest as uh, not only economists, but also statisticians, mm -hmm. uh, sociologists, and we share some common culture based mostly around math and econometrics and right. data, I think it's uh, what the, the, the tribute this year is particularly well uh, suited for us and, and, and having you is a real pleasure and honor. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, it's a great tradition, Francis. I hope that you, uh, you described the material accurately. In, in, case, in case you didn't, uh, I, here's a link to my taped Nobel lecture. Uh, <laughs> which is uh, pretty funny, actually. <laughs> By the standards of Nobel lectures, I would say it's pretty funny. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it, Francis? Xavier, have you? No. You guys haven't seen it? Uh, I, I did. I watched. Uh, so I advised the students, actually, uh, in general, for all the Nobel every year, the committee is doing a great work at summarizing and doing a review of the works. And so... I strongly advise everyone to check yeah. this website. But this this particular lecture is, is me in a me in a film studio. It's not the Nobel Committee. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's it's work that I did. I do I work with Marginal Revolution University to produce instructional content, uh, which you guys can also use uh, in your teaching. I produce uh, kind of eight minute uh, videos. Uh, here's a link to that mastering. It's called Mastering Econometrics. And uh, I use it in my classroom. And uh, I also work with them on, uh, on the Nobel uh, video. And we try to make it funny and engaging by the, by the standards of econometrics, which is which are pretty, pretty low. <laughs> so gra grab those, grab those links. Thank you. Edward, Thanks a lot. Um, so I propose to finish. Maybe we can take a good yeah. picture on uh, on Zoom. Uh, if sure. uh, everybody wants to open up, uh, you know, turn on their camera, uh, I will take a, a screenshot. And uh, so unfortunately, we are more than 80, so I won't be able to have uh, everyone on the camera. But uh, 
Um, oh, okay. wonderful. Big so, group. Smile, say the <laughs> instrumental variables and smile. And, uh, okay. Empirical <laughs> strategies. Empirical. Yes, we'll send you if you want Causal the slides effect. that everyone has used, Xavier and Pauline. Okay, that's okay. great. Yeah, I would love to see that, I'm sure. Yeah, so we will post. Oh, fun. maybe Josh, you, you were closing your eyes, so I can take another one. <laughs> <laughs> that will be the. So, be ready. One, two. Okay, much better. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you guys. Wonderful to see everybody. I hope I'll see you in Paris soon. Hey, we, we hope so. We, we yeah. Hope so. Thanks. Bye bye. Um, Ciao. Ciao. So this is the end of the, of the lecture. Thanks a lot, everyone. I hope we enjoyed it. So we will post it on YouTube and uh, and we'll post the slides on the website of Crest. We will try, uh, so you, you already sent it uh, to me. So we will try to put it on the website. And so thanks everyone. Cool.